Welcome to the FaithBridge Sermon Podcast. Be sure to keep watching immediately after the sermon for Postscript, a weekly podcast with in-depth content and answers to your questions submitted during the sermon. You can also find it on iTunes or at faithbridge.org slash postscript. Neighbors? Dude, there goes the neighborhood. Well, life is just full of surprises, isn't it? Good morning and welcome. To those of you here at the Klein campus, to those of you at our Woodlands campus, to those of you who are worshiping with us online, we are so glad that you have chosen to worship at Faithbridge today. We are in the final message of our sermon series that we have been calling Next, and it's all about moving on to the next step in our journey with Christ, learning how not to stall out, not to become stagnant, but to keep moving forward in uh, the relationship we have with Jesus, in the next thing that he's calling us to do and to become. And we've been using as our role model uh, the life of the apostle Peter. Now, Peter was a man who knew a thing or two about taking the next step. Sometimes he took the next step because of a horrendous failure. Sometimes he took the next step because of an amazing success. But whatever the case... Something that could never be said of Peter was that he was stagnant, that he stalled out. Jesus was always three steps ahead of Peter, constantly beckoning, constantly calling him on to the next place of growth, to the next place that he wanted Peter to learn how to become a man of God. And as I was preparing the message, it occurred to me that that's a good way to think about our relationship with Christ. He still is about three steps ahead of us. And he knows precisely what our particular growth edge may be. And there he stands in front of each one of us, beckoning, calling, challenging us to move on to the next place in our journey with him. Today we're going to be looking at what was probably the biggest challenge that Peter faced in his life and ministry. Matter of fact, it's so big, uh, the book of Acts takes five full chapters to bring about its resolution. What we're going to be talking about today is overcoming prejudice, dealing with prejudicial attitudes, dealing with racism. It was a struggle for Peter, it was a struggle for the entire early church, and it's a struggle for us as well. We're going to be in the book of Acts. Uh, If you need a Bible, just raise your hand. Our ushers will be glad to give you one. They're coming down the aisles. Acts is the fifth book in the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts. We're going to be in Acts chapter 10. If you want to go ahead and turn there and just uh, hold it with a place marker, we will begin reading in Acts chapter 10, verse 9, in just a few minutes. But before we uh, move on with the message, let's take a minute and pray together. Father, we are so grateful for the privilege, the freedom, the opportunity that we have to gather here in your house 
to lift up the name of your son Jesus in the power of your Holy Spirit. We are grateful that we can come here with the knowledge that you love us unconditionally. That there is not one iota of prejudice, of stereotyping, of failing to love any of us because of our skin color, our ethnicity, any other thing about us. You simply love us and accept us for who we are. And so as we turn our attention now to this uh, timely topic, timely for our culture, our country, our own individual lives, we pray for your wisdom. We pray, Lord, that you would give us the mind of Christ in thinking about these things. I pray that you would give to me uh, the anointing of your Holy Spirit to say what needs to be said and that you would give to those who've gathered here ears to hear and hearts that are open to receive all that you have for us today. We offer our prayer in the strong name of Jesus. Amen. Back when I was in seminary, I spent one of those summers working as an intern at a large church out in the Pacific Northwest. And I remember, just like it was yesterday, making the long flight from my home in Atlanta, Georgia, all the way out to Washington State, landing there and being somewhat uh, taken aback, really, at how curious the folks were in this community about this born and bred Southerner. I got the impression that maybe they hadn't been around too many Southerners in their lifetime. And I endured an entire summer's worth of good-natured teasing about every Southern curiosity I possess. I mean, they would just howl with laughter every time that I said I was fixing to do something. Or if I said, y'all, any sort of Uh, curiosity they could discover, they were quick to pounce on it and point out, you know, what a wacky guy you Southerners uh, can be. And it was good-natured and fun for the most part. I didn't uh, worry too much about it. But I remember one night I was with a group of high school students undergoing the ritual teasing of Dan about his Southernisms. And one young man asked me out of the blue, why do all you Southerners hate black people? And I thought to myself and, and said to him, why, why would you ask that? What, what on earth makes you think that? And he said, oh, oh come on, Dan. Every, everybody knows that Southerners don't like blacks. I mean, you know, you've got the whole slavery thing and civil rights movement. And all, you know, it's common knowledge that Southerners just don't care for black people, hate black people. I said, well, I'll be the first to admit that there are plenty of Southerners who have strong prejudicial attitudes, some of them very blatant, overt, and some, to be frank, are, are proud of their prejudicial attitudes. But I don't think you can say of every Southerner that we all hate black people. That, that's a strong word. And That's sort of a prejudicial statement in and of itself. You're you're making a blanket statement about a whole group of people, a a rather uninformed one at at that. And and furthermore, uh, you need to understand that prejudicial attitudes are not a geographical phenomenon. Prejudicial attitudes are everywhere, all over the place. Every single one of us carry some measure of, some degree of prejudicial attitudes towards some group of people. It's, it's endemic to human nature. We all have it. Oh, no, 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 not, not us. It's different up here in Washington. You see, but we, we don't have those kind of difficulties. We like black people here. It's, it's all good here. Oh, okay, well... News to me, I was not in the mood to get into a rip-roaring debate with a 16-year-old that night, so I just (laughs) kind of let that one go by the wayside. 
But as the summer progressed, I noticed that in this particular community, uh, it, it was big apple country. I'm talking about the fruit, not the computer. Uh, acres and acres and acres of orchards. And the very large orchards frequently employed migrant farm workers to pick and store all of the apples. And uh, as you might imagine, most of these migrant workers lived in abject poverty. Uh, I, I saw several uh, structures, homes, if you will, that were built out of the crates that they stored the apples in. They found empty crates and tried to make a semblance of a house. It was backbreaking work. The pay was next to nothing. And the members of this migrant community were not, by any stretch, the most esteemed members of the larger community. So one Sunday night, I was with the youth group, and I said, okay, y'all, <laughs> we're going to play a little uh, word association game. I'm going to call out a word, and then you all just call back to me the first thing that comes into your mind, and I'll, I'll write your responses up on the board. So first word, football, and immediately, you know, Seahawks, Huskies, okay, uh, automobile, Toyota, Mercedes, Ford, all right, um, orchard, apples, uh, Mexicans, okay, Mexican, lazy, greasy, dishonest. I paused right there. And I said, okay, now let me get this straight. So you folks don't have any problem with black people. You just reserve all of your prejudicial attitudes for Mexicans, for Hispanics. Is that, is that it? No, no, Dan, see, you, you know, you don't understand. You, you haven't lived here. You don't know what it's like to be around these people. I mean, you know, th this is how they really are. Well, I was in a mood to talk about it that night. <laughs> and we went headlong into a very interesting discussion about the nature of prejudice and racism. And I pointed out to them the words, the derogatory, hateful words that you said are the same kinds of words that prejudiced people in the South use about blacks and other groups that they don't particularly care for. There's no difference. Prejudice knows no boundaries. It's in all of our hearts. Maybe you haven't burned any crosses in anybody's yard. Maybe you don't use the N-word. Maybe you don't tell ethnic jokes. But those things are just outward expressions of inward attitudes. And some of us are just a little more polished at keeping those things on the inside, but that doesn't mean that they aren't there. No, they're there in each and every one of us to some degree in some measure, about some group of people. I remember Andrew Young, the former mayor of Atlanta, a former close associate of Martin Luther King Jr., saying one time that he would much rather deal with someone who was in touch with the fact that he was racist to some degree, honest and open about his own struggle with racism, than to deal with someone who lived with the fantasy that they did not struggle with racism, utterly clueless about how they really thought and felt on the inside. Peter struggled with racism, and Jesus stood before him and said, come on, Peter, we're going to the next step. Because you see, the story that we are going to read in just a moment took place when the church was just a baby, just getting started. And God knew 
that if this age-old problem of racism was not dealt with early, it was going to tear the young church apart and destroy the good work that the Holy Spirit was trying to do. And so he purposefully put Peter in a position where he had to face his own racism, face the racism that existed in the early church, and begin to address it head on. We're going to be reading in Acts chapter 10. Let me give you a little background before we begin reading. This particular story is about uh, an episode that took place between Peter and a Roman centurion by the name of Cornelius. Now, Cornelius, of course, was a Gentile. A Gentile is anyone who is not a Jew. And a good Jew in those days had very little, I mean very little, to do with Gentiles. They would do their dead level best to limit it to just business transactions, if at all possible. A good Jew would never sit down and have a meal with a Gentile, and certainly never go in a Gentile's home. That just was not done in those days. But one day, an angel appeared to Cornelius and said to him, Cornelius, I want you to send three of your servants to the town of Joppa. I want them to go to a a certain house, and they're going to find a man there by the name of Simon Peter. I want them to invite Peter to come back with them to your house here in Caesarea. Cornelius obeyed the vision and sent the servants on to Joppa. And about that time, Peter was having a uh, divine encounter of his own. And we pick up in verse 9 of chapter 10. About noon the following day, as they, meaning the three servants, were on their journey and approaching the city, Peter went up on the roof to pray. He became hungry and wanted something to eat, and while the meal was being prepared, he fell into a trance. He saw heaven opened and something like a large sheet being let down to earth by its four corners. It contained all kinds of four-footed animals as well as reptiles and birds. Then a voice told him, "'Get up, Peter.' Kill and eat. Surely not, Lord, Peter replied. I have never eaten anything impure or unclean. The voice spoke to him a second time. Do not call anything impure that God has made clean. This happened three times, and immediately the sheet was taken back to heaven. While Peter was wondering about the meaning of the vision, the men sent by Cornelius found out where Simon's house was and stopped at the gate. They called out, asking if Simon, who was known as Peter, was staying there. While Peter was still thinking about the vision, the Spirit said to him, Simon, three men are looking for you, so get up and go downstairs. Do not hesitate to go with them, for I have sent them. Peter went down and said to the men, I am the one you're looking for. Why have you come? The men replied, We have come from Cornelius the centurion. He is a righteous and God-fearing man who is respected by all the Jewish people. A holy angel told him to ask you to come to his house so he could hear what you have to say. Then Peter invited the men into the house to be his guests. The next day, Peter started out with them, and some of the believers from Joppa went along. The following day, he arrived in Caesarea. Cornelius was expecting them and had called together his relatives and close friends. As Peter entered the house, Cornelius met him and fell at his feet in reverence. But Peter made him get up. Stand up, he said. I am only a man myself. While talking with him, Peter went inside and found a large gathering of people. He said to them, You are well aware that it is against our law for a Jew to associate or visit a Gentile. But God has shown me that I should not call anyone impure or unclean. So when I was sent for, I came without raising any objection. May I ask why you sent for me? Cornelius answered, Three days ago I was in my house praying at this hour, at three in the afternoon. Suddenly a man in shining clothes stood before me and said, Cornelius, God has heard your prayer and remembered your gifts to the poor. Send to Joppa for Simon, who is called Peter. He is a guest in the home of Simon the Tanner, who lives by the sea. So I sent for you immediately, and it was good of you to come. Now we are all here in the presence of God to listen to everything the Lord has commanded you to tell us. Then Peter began to speak. I now realize how true it is that God does not show favoritism but accepts every nation, from every nation, the one who fears him 
and does what is right. 2,000 years later, it's difficult for us to wrap our minds around what a huge, huge leap this was for Peter. I mean, to bridge the gap between the Jewish community and the Gentile community was uh, the biggest thing that Peter had ever been challenged to do. And so I want us to look at this story and draw from it several important life lessons that I think can help us as we deal with our own prejudicial attitudes and our own struggle with racism. And the first thing that I notice about this story is that the challenge came to Peter, the, the beckoning came to Peter to move to the next step during a time of prayer. I don't think that was an accident. I don't think it was an accident at all that Peter was praying when this challenge came his way. Several years ago, I was teaching in India at a conference center, which happens to have its own bookstore. And so one day during the break, I decided to mosey down there and see what sort of titles they had, maybe find something for my free time to read. Unfortunately, uh, when I got there, I discovered that all of the titles were either written in Hindi or Telugu, and uh, I haven't gotten around to learning either one of those yet. It's on my to-do list, but uh, I was walking out of the bookstore, and just before I got to the door, out of the corner of my eye, I saw one English title, and it was written by one of my favorite authors, a man by the name of A.W. Tozer. If you've never read Tozer before... Uh, sell everything you have, go and buy his books. He is a great man of God, a great writer. And the title of the book was one that I will never forget. The title was, God Tells the Man Who Cares. God Tells the Man Who Cares. And in the book, Dr. Tozer explains that if we really want to know what God's will is for our lives, if we really want to move on to the next step in our journey with Christ, We've got to communicate that to God. We've got to let God know we're interested in what he has to say, and we've got to do that through the means he has given to us, namely prayer. God is not in the business of chasing you and me down, getting us in a headlock, and forcing us to understand what it is he wants us to know. God is looking for men and women who are eager to know what God thinks who are eager to be challenged by God, who are eager to move on to the next step. And it is to those men and women that God shares his plan. We need to be in prayer not only to hear God's voice, not only to understand what it is God wants us to do, but we need to be in prayer so that we might receive grace and mercy and strength and courage in order to do what he is revealing to us, he wants us to do. Like no other sin I can think of, racism, prejudice, has the most insidious, pernicious character. It can dwell in the dark places of our hearts and convince us that it's not really there, that we're not one of those kind of racist prejudiced people. And then when it does rear its head on occasion, as it inevitably does, it is quick to justify itself. And we think to ourselves, well, I had every right to feel that way. I had every right to think those thoughts because of what they did or what they said or who they are. It is a tenacious, slippery sin. One commentator that I read said, it is often the last stronghold in our lives that the Spirit has to sanctify. All throughout our lives, Christ is putting his finger on different sins and different areas that he wants us to grow. But the roots of racism and prejudice run so deep that they don't budge too easy. And it's not uncommon that that particular sin isn't dealt with until the end of our lives, and sometimes, sadly, not even at the end. People move on to eternity with those same misguided, unbiblical attitudes. How about you? 
Are you a person of prayer who's coming before God? Are you letting him know that you care? Is God able to tell you what he thinks and give you the grace to do it because you've demonstrated to him that you want to know what he thinks? Maybe especially about prejudicial attitudes and racism. It was absolutely necessary for Peter to be in prayer in order to receive these things, to have grace to do them, and to be able to do the second life lesson I see in this story. Not only did Peter pray about these things, but Peter was willing to grapple with this stuff. He was willing to wrestle with God about it. You remember when the sheep dropped before him the first time and the voice said, rise, Peter, kill and eat. What did he say? Oh, sure, I think I'll have a bite. No, he backed off like it was radioactive. Never, Lord, far be it from me. I've never eaten anything unclean. I never will. But God kept dropping the sheet in front of him. Three times. I don't know if that's because Peter was so stubborn or because God was so persistent or maybe a combination of the two. But in the end, Peter was willing to wrestle with God. He was willing to be challenged and he was willing to take on the challenge that God was placing before him. Unfortunately, most of us aren't quite so eager to wrestle with God on this one. Far too many of us, I think, opt for one of two other options that are so much easier and so much less trouble than dealing with the issue. We either deny that we do have a problem in that area, or we acknowledge that we have a problem, but we just choose not to do anything about it. We just ignore it. Those of us that live in denial are masters at fooling ourselves about this. I'm pretty confident that a few minutes ago, when I suggested the very first time that all of us struggle with racism to some degree, there was at least a handful of folks here this morning who bowed up right then and said, well, he ain't talking to me today because I ain't no racist. Well, I've come to tell you this morning, you are, and I am too. I've got prejudicial attitudes. You've got prejudicial attitudes. All God's children have prejudicial attitudes. And the reason I can say that is because the Bible describes all of us as sinners. It's not just that we do sinful things, but we are sinful people. And a fundamental characteristic of sin is a preoccupation with self. If you were here a couple of weeks ago, you know that we talked about how we are, each and every one, our own favorite person. We are enamored with ourselves. We love ourselves. We are self-oriented and self-ish. And so, if we meet someone who happens to be blessed and or smart enough to be like us, we're drawn to that person. Whether it's a matter of ethnicity, skin color, political persuasion, what have you, we are drawn to people who are like us because after all, we're pretty good. And if they're so fortunate to be like us, we're going to bless them with our company. (laughs) Conversely, when we encounter someone who is not like us, we're filled with fear and suspicion and uncertainty And it's just better if they stay over there and we stay over here. Blackbirds don't fly with bluebirds. You stay there and I'll stay here. And we deny the reality of our own racist attitudes. And it doesn't have to be just about race. We can be prejudicial about all kinds of things. Maybe some of you here today struggle with being a chauvinist. You devalue women. And really, you just wish they would stay in their place. Others of us here today really have a problem with the poor. And while we may not say it out loud, we think to ourselves, you know, the lazy bums, if they just 
they just get out and get a job. Maybe I could respect them, even though we know nothing about their lives. Others of us have a problem with people who are overweight. And again, we wouldn't dare say it out loud, but to ourselves, we think thoughts and say things like, lazy? Get up and do something. Just quit eating so much. Maybe you get over it. Others of us have a real problem with uh, gay people. There's, there's just something about that sin in particular that really bugs us. Never mind all the other sins in the world. We can deal with all of those, but that one, oh no, that, phew, sorry, draw the line right there. Some of us have very prejudicial attitudes about anyone who happens to be an Arab or a Muslim. Because, you know, they're, they're all about violence. You see, prejudicial attitudes are snaky and slippery and tenacious. And they are so difficult to identify and so easily hidden that we fool even ourselves about whether or not we have them. And if we're not in denial about it, maybe, on the other hand, we acknowledged a long time ago, yeah, I, I do have those. That, that is a struggle for me, but, you know, I'm, just, I'm not going to deal with that. I've got bigger fish to fry. We see things on TV like you know, Trayvon Martin and Ferguson, Missouri and Baltimore, and it's just so big and tangled up and messed up and overwhelming. It's just easier to turn the TV off and just forget about it. Despite the fact that maybe God is speaking through those things to us. Not necessarily saying, go to Baltimore, but maybe he's saying, change your heart. But it's so much easier just to be complacent and lazy and ignore it. And it's so much easier to offer up the silliest excuses for our racism for our prejudiced attitudes. I wish I had a nick. No, I wish I had a dollar for every time in my life that I have heard someone say, typically about someone else, someone that they love and care about, well, yeah, he's, he's sort of prejudiced, but you know, he was raised that way. That has to be the most asinine rationalization on record. We don't say that about any other sin. Hey, did you hear about Billy Bob robbed a bank and shot somebody? Oh, you can't hold it against him. I mean, he was raised that way. <laughs> what about old Susie Q? Cheated on her husband, left him and the kids all by themselves. Well, you know, don't be too rough on her. She was raised that way. No, we don't say that about anything else. But for some reason, we put racism and prejudicial attitudes into a special box, the excuse box. We were raised that way. Well, let me tell you something. If you were raised that way, it's time to grow up. You're an adult. You get to decide. I don't care if your daddy and your daddy's daddy felt that way. They're not going to be standing before the Lord one day to give an accounting for your life. You are. And let me give you a little tip. When you stand before the Lord one day, as we all will, and we give an accounting for our racist, prejudicial attitudes, whatever they may be, I wouldn't say if I were you, well, I was raised that way. <laughs> I don't think that's going to fly. I don't think it's going to work. It's so much easier to just deny that it's there. Or on the other hand, acknowledge, yeah, it's there, but I'm just not going to deal with it. God purposely put Peter in a position where he had to deal with it. 
And I believe God is calling each one of us, even today, to wake up and realize I cannot carry hatred, stereotypes, prejudice in my heart and call myself a Christ follower at the same time. Peter wrestled with it. And it was necessary that he wrestled with it so that he could do the third thing I see in this story, and that is he repented of his sin. He repented. Now, that's a good church word. That's a good Bible word, but don't let it throw you. Repentance is really a very simple concept. It's hard to do, but the idea is easy to grasp. It's a two-step process when we repent. First of all, we confess our sin. Now, to confess something simply means to agree with. When we confess our sins to God, we are agreeing with his assessment of us that we are sinful. And he is pleased when we own it, when we recognize, yes, that's a reality for me. But we cannot stop there. It's not enough just to confess. You'll notice God didn't let Peter off the hook simply by confessing. No, there was a second part of the repentance, and that is to take action. Decisive change of behavior. Peter was expected to get up and go and do something. Something that had never entered his wildest dreams. In verse 27, we are explicitly told that he stepped inside Cornelius' house. I promise you, he had never been within 50 yards of a, of a Gentile's front door prior to that moment. He was a good Jew, and good Jews didn't go anywhere near Gentile homes, much less walk right in the door. God said, Peter, it's not going to be enough just for you to say, okay, I get it, no. I want you to put some shoe leather on that confession and show me the repentance in your heart. And that's why Peter was able to stand up and say before Cornelius and the entire gathered Cornelius family, I've had a revelation. God has shown me. He is no respecter of persons. There is no favoritism. He loves everybody from every nation, regardless of ethnicity, skin color. Those are not issues that matter to God. And from this day forward, they don't matter to me either. That's the beauty of our gospel, friends. It's all about change. Jesus did not come to earth, die on a cross, and be raised from the dead three days later just so we could have a ticket to heaven. It's not all about the sweet by and by. The gospel is about the difficult and trying and nasty here and now, where we have to rub shoulders who, with people who aren't like us with people maybe we don't even like. But that's why the gospel is a part of our lives. The power of Jesus, the same power that raised him from the dead, is able to set us free from our prejudicial attitudes, from our racist thoughts about all kinds of groups, and begin to conform us to the image of Jesus himself. That's what it's all about. That's why we gather here at Faith Bridge, so that we can be different. I don't know what the action step is that God has in mind for you, but I know that he has one. He's got one for you and he's got one for me. Maybe, just maybe, the action step God wants you to take is to spend some time with some kids who don't come from a neighborhood quite like yours. Our nonprofit ministry, Bridging for Tomorrow, is based down in the southern part of the Klein ISD. And they're investing in the lives of kids who desperately need love and attention and kindness. Matter of fact, next month, June 16th through the 18th, we're going to be putting on a sports camp for those kids down there at Island Elementary. And we need volunteers. We need faith bridgers to show up and help make that thing happen. When you leave here today, if you'll go by our bridging center, there are folks there 
who'll be glad to tell you all about it and sign you up. Maybe the action step that God has for you is to invite that neighbor of yours next door, across the street, wherever, who's just different. And it may be different skin color. It may be different political party. It may be different whatever. But God wants you to invite them to your small group and show them the love of Jesus through your generosity, your hospitality, your kindness. Maybe the action step God has for you is to go on a mission trip and to go to a country where people don't look like you, think like you, talk like you, eat like you, but you get there and your eyes are opened and you realize God loves these people too. And God is working and moving in their lives just like he does mine. I'd love to take you. I don't know what the plan is. I don't know what the action step is, but I know that God has one for all of us. And I don't hesitate a minute to say we live in a time, a crucial time, when the church of Jesus Christ needs to step up and lead the way for our nation in the healing of these prejudicial racist attitudes. We cannot look to the government. We can't look to law enforcement. We can't look to the Kiwanis Club or any other social organization. We are the church. We are about life change. We are about the love of Jesus Christ. And God is looking to you and me first to move out into this world and to make a difference. Amen. So here's what I'm going to ask you to do. I'm going to pray for us in just a moment, and uh, I'm not going to pray long, just briefly. But when I finish that prayer, I'm going to go kneel right over here at this altar to confess my own sin, because I struggle with it just like you. I'm going to go over here and pray so that I can hear from God what my action step needs to be, and I want to invite you to come down and join me. Maybe that is the action step you need to take simply to get out of your chair and come and fill this altar area confessing, yes, Lord, we've been derelict as the church. Come down here and do business with God so that when you leave today, you can go out into this world and do business for God. And take that next step. Let's pray. Father, we stand before you guilty. Guilty of denying, guilty of ignoring, posturing that somehow we escaped this sin. But you know our hearts. And so I pray, Lord, as your people meet you in this time of prayer, you'd help us to be honest and transparent with you with our friends, and to hear clearly from you what it is you would have us to do to make a difference in our part of the world. In Jesus' name I pray. Welcome to Postscript. Here we hope to answer your questions and help you dig deeper into the messages and sermons at FaithBridge by talking with the teacher of the day. Hello and welcome to Postscript. My name is Adam McIntyre and I'm the high school pastor here at FaithBridge. And I am joined by Dan Slagle, who just gave an incredible sermon on overcoming prejudice, which is actually the last sermon of the next series. And Dan, thanks so much for being here thanks with us. Me. And thank yeah. you for your incredibly powerful and, and timely sermon on overcoming prejudice. And the first question that we had um, that actually came in uh, was, what is a Christian's action when they are the ones being discriminated against. This particular uh, person had tattoos and feels like she was being discriminated against because of the way she looks with her tattoos. So how should a Christian respond when they feel discriminated against? Okay, so this is sort of a reversal of, of what we were talking about, yeah. Um, well, several thoughts come to mind. Um, first, 
I think about Jesus uh, saying that we should love our enemies and pray for those who persecute us. I think that would be step number one, that we pray for whoever is doing us harm. I think God can work in and through those prayers, not only to change that person, but also to reveal things to us about ourselves that perhaps we're blind to. Um, That leads to suggestion number two, which would be to earnestly search our own hearts and try to discern where am I prejudicial? Mm -hmm. And how can that self-knowledge help me understand this person and why maybe they are behaving this way toward me? And then third, if it were possible, I would suggest having a conversation with this individual and not in a threatening uh, or pouty sort of way, but simply sitting down like you and I are Mm -hmm. and saying, uh, I wish you would help me understand something here. Uh, I've observed that you don't particularly care for my tattoos. It seems to really rub you the wrong way. Can you help me understand why that is so difficult for you? And see if a face-to-face conversation can't bring just a little bit closer to uh, a more peaceable relationship. Absolutely. And going back to what you had said uh, just now and even in your sermon, you said that almost all of us deal with some kind of prejudice in our lives. Uh, We all have some form of prejudice. So how can we identify our own prejudice if it's not outwardly apparent? Okay. Um, Well, again, uh, I think first step would be to to pray Mm. and to ask God for discernment, ask Him for wisdom, uh, self-understanding. He he really has a remarkable way of putting His finger on the things that are displeasing to Him. But beyond that, I would encourage someone to uh, take their own pulse, their own prejudicial pulse. Mm -hmm. Uh, Pay attention to yourself and notice what what sort of situations elicit a response from me? Uh, are there certain news stories that, that make me angry? Uh, are there certain people groups that I, I find myself feeling uh, distrustful toward mm. or uh, suspicious of? Um, are there certain kinds of jokes and things that mm. I either tell or I laugh at? You know, a lot of it is just looking in the mirror and observing with a more focused sort of vision, yeah, I I do get angry about that. Mm -hmm. I I do feel a visceral response to this people group. Uh, I think between prayer and paying attention to oneself, you can probably discern pretty quickly where it is. Absolutely, and I would imagine that's gonna take quite a bit of honesty on your part as well. yeah. Yeah, to be able to identify those things. Yeah. And this last question was uh, another one that was sent in to us. And uh, she was asking, can we become so accepting that we end up compromising our witness as Christians? Well, uh, I, I think uh, we have to be careful about how we use a word like accept. I think a more appropriate word in the context of my sermon is uh, not the degree to which we accept, but the degree to which we love. Using Jesus as our role model. Mm -hmm. Uh, Jesus was known to hang out with drunkards, prostitutes, thieves, I mean, the lowest of the low. And yet, uh, his time with them was not spent condoning their behavior, Mm -hmm. certainly not becoming like them, but loving them Mm -hmm. in spite of their behavior. And I think it's certainly possible for us to love someone else and not be condoning of their behavior. Um, One word of caution I suppose I would give is, let's say that uh, there is a a particular people group who engages in, you know, let's just say drinking. And that's been a struggle for you in the past. Right. Well, I probably wouldn't go and hang out at the bar, you know. <laughs> the temptation is going to be too great right. there. But, uh, you know, all things being equal, putting that aside, it is perfectly possible, and I would say even uh, expected, mm-hmm. that as followers of Christ, we would move into this world not to condone it, not to approve of it, but rather to love it and hopefully love it in a redemptive sort of way that points people toward Jesus. 
Absolutely. Well, thank you again so much yeah. uh, for that incredible sermon. And thank you all for tuning in. We will see you all next week. Thanks for joining us for Postscript. Help us keep the podcast interactive by submitting your questions during the morning services. Learn more at faithbridge.org postscript.